I'm Francine Ballard, style editor at large with Paper City Magazine, and I'm here today with Eric Huffman, lead pastor, head pastor of the story, a church here, a non traditional church. Can I say that? Sure, here that's in perfect. Houston. <laughs> and are you affiliated with St. Luke's in any way? Yes, yes uh, we are considered part of St. Luke's. We are under the organizational umbrella of St. Luke's. I'm officially a pastor, an associate pastor of St. Luke's, but this is my only job to okay. lead the story. And you do it well. Oh, thank you. But let's dig right in. I think I would love for you to tell the story of the story. How did this come to be? Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to St. Luke's to begin with. Uh, that congregation saw a uh, potential. They saw an opening. Uh, they have been in this community, a stalwart in the River Oaks community for decades, since 1945, I think. Mm. Um, and so they were doing fine, but uh, they also saw this missional opening because they saw the community around the church changing, new mm. demographics, but not all those demographics were coming to St. Luke's. Mm. So they wanted to start something brand new that uh, has a different mission, uh, different target audience, if you will. And, mm -hmm. and they had that vision. They brought my wife and I down from Kansas City. Very in forward 2000. thinking. Yeah, they really were. And uh, since 2015, that's what we've been working on. So you were in Kansas City and you were preaching, was the message that you were preaching there similar to what you're preaching here? Or did they come and find you because they liked your message? Or how does that work? I'm not exactly sure how they found me, but it was <laughs> not the same message um, because the timing of this was so, I feel like, inspired by God. In uh, 2013, I had this overwhelming experience in the Holy Land of all places, okay. in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, where I think I actually, for the first time in my life, became a Christian. That was where I felt the Spirit of God come over me and I was ready. I just sort of surrendered because before that, I was just this rebellious spirit. And we were doing good things. Yeah. It was all about social justice and feeding the poor and doing all the things Jesus said to do. Mm -hmm. But my heart wasn't in the right place. I mm -hmm. had a very rebellious spirit about the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always say conservative Christians at that point in my life were sort of the bane of my existence. And mm -hmm. I lived this kind of this social justice liberal uh, wild streak from 20 to 33 years old. I can see that. I mean, your, your, your sermons sometimes sound more like an academic conversation or something like a class that I'm taking in college or the one might take in college. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what's interesting and so different about this place is that your message is so, so different. So you honed your message according to St. Luke's mission to come here and then it sounds like it just took off. It just took it on a life of its own. Is that yeah. fair to say? So I think before that conversion experience, I knew kind of what, what the Bible says the world should look like, right? Mm -hmm. No one should go hungry. We should all look out for each other. Mm -hmm. Look after your brother. You know, that's what God told Cain yeah. in Genesis 4. And the mm -hmm. whole Bible really is about loving our neighbors. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand the heart change. And it turns out that you can't really have the world God wants without letting him change your heart first. Yeah. And so my heart changed in 2013, and that's where my message began to shift away from this kind of, what are you doing to change the world? Why aren't you doing more yeah. to help people? And it's very kind of shame-driven, yeah. and that's why we were always burning out in mm -hmm. Kansas City. I was always hitting the wall. Mm -hmm. um, but after my heart changed, I realized this isn't about proving ourselves to be good enough. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want us to work ourselves to the bone just to prove that we love him or that we love our neighbors. Mm -hmm. God has forgiven our sins. God mm -hmm. has set us free. God loves us so much mm -hmm. that our lives can then be an outpouring from that mm -hmm. reality mm -hmm. rather than trying to just work and work and work to make the world a better place. That makes sense. Well, explain to our readers or viewers who don't know what you do here. Yeah. Well, how is your message different? and? I mean, for example, you call your church a place for skeptics. Yeah. Um, articulate that a little bit yeah. and, and what you mean by that. <laughs> That's really the heart of the story. So when we began, we, we decided to have a mission uh, that says we are here to inspire non-religious Houstonians to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. And all my ministry buddies thought I was crazy. Like, why would you start a church? <laughs> for non-religious people. What happens when they become members and they're religious now, you know, are you not? Have you lost people because now they're religious? Or? <laughs> no, no, the, the whole point <laughs> is that once you become a Christian, you don't become more religious. Yeah. You become more in love with God. And so, you know, religion is fine, it has its place, but really we're here to follow Jesus and really mm -hmm. let our lives speak mm -hmm. about the love of God in us. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we claimed that mission from the very start. And what that means is when you come into this church, 
It doesn't feel like a church. And I hear that from people mm -hmm. all the time. It mm -hmm. feels different. It feels strange. It feels awesome. But I, I hear people say it feels like home. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's because we don't make any assumptions about what you should believe when you walk in these doors. Mm -hmm. We don't make any assumptions about what you know about the Bible, what you don't know. Like we're kind of starting from scratch mm -hmm. every Sunday. And so every time I open the Bible, mm -hmm. I explain what I'm reading. Mm -hmm. I don't assume everybody knows what, what yeah. the Bible is or mm -hmm. who wrote it or what mm -hmm. it says. Mm -hmm. And so we st sort of start from scratch. I think that's the first part. And the second most important thing is we're always open to questions. Mm -hmm. There are no bad questions. There are no questions that aren't allowed. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in worship or after the worship, online, in our small groups, everybody knows you can ask any questions that are on your hearts. And that's really important to people. Yeah. Well, your format, whatever you're doing must be working because I don't know how you can explain your growth otherwise. You know, oh, three man. chapters now and you're, you're building another, you're planting another church, that's right? That's right, yes. Yeah, in, in Timber Grove. In the Timber Grove part of, okay. of Houston. Yeah, this year we actually finished the, the build out of that facility. In the midst of COVID. In the midst of COVID. And talk about that for a that's second. That's a miracle. Like, what is, well, yeah, what, that's a miracle into itself. <laughs> well, the first, first miracle is that the construction's done on time. That's just uh -huh. because the construction workers had no other work to do. So they were begging for it and we were ready. Yeah. So with that building's ready to go, it's at 8200 Washington. It's not another church, it's just another, um, another expression of the story. So we're, we're one church in two locations now. Mm -hmm. um, and that building will be opening soon. It's got its own campus pastor. It's gonna have its own scene over there. Mm -hmm. um, I can't explain the growth either. It, it has outpaced our preparation. <laughs> it has outpaced our structures. Yeah. Like it has been a blessing, but an exhausting blessing. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that is frankly, what is interesting, you know, to someone who's not religious even, yeah. is sort of what's going on here. It's sort of a phenomenon, in my yeah. opinion, because the growth is explosive and the message must be resonating with a huge cross-section of Houstonians. It's wild. And I try to figure out who your parishioners are and it's sort of, it, it runs the gamut, right? It I really mean, does. You can speak to that. Yeah, it's, it's a cross-section of, you know, we've got like, River Oaks, uh, sort of Houston Chronicles best dressed coming here and we've got, you know, 20 something um, working at the uh, coffee shop part time. Uh, we've yeah. got some people that fit into the normal Christian mold and a lot of people that don't fit yeah. into the normal Christian mold, old and young. And I think the, the common denominator yeah. is a genuine search for truth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people that want to be able to ask their questions Mm -hmm. and they don't want to feel manipulated. And so that's why we don't really push membership very mm -hmm. much. Uh, the mm -hmm. number of members at the story is like a fraction mm -hmm. of the number of people at the story because mm -hmm. membership doesn't, I don't read a lot in the Bible about church membership. Mm -hmm. I, I read a lot about discipleship and doing mm -hmm. life together. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think a lot of that stuff feels really institutional to people. Yeah. And, and people have a real radar for institutional roadblocks or mm -hmm. institutional manipulation. And they don't get a lot of that at the story. No, you don't. And, and, and one thing that I have found very interesting um, is your, when you talk about materialistic Christians mm. versus spiritual Christians, or I think you call them, I mean, you-, you Mystical. Mystical mm -hmm. Christians. And, and you, your wife, Gio, would be a mystical Christian. Yes, very much so. <laughs> and, uh, but unfortunately, I think most of us fall into the second category and it's not what it sounds like. So it's why not. don't you explain to me yeah, really you. what it is and how it translates? Yeah, so materialism versus mysticism is a battle we all face every day, whether we know it or not. Materialism isn't just somebody that goes shopping a lot or wants to. Uh, materialism is really just living as though what we see and taste and touch and experience, mm -hmm. the things we want, the things we want, like that's all there is. Mm -hmm. So the material world is all there is and all there ever will be and all that really matters. Mm -hmm. And the mystic, uh, the mystical world looks at that and goes, no, there's something more. Mm -hmm. And we all know there's something more. Mm -hmm. Like there's real love in the world. Yeah. And that's not something you can buy. It's not a commodity. Yeah. And there's, there's real evil yeah. in the world. And that's not really on the shelves at the marketplace. There's, there's good, there's evil, there's love, there's hate. There's all of these things that tell us there's another world mm -hmm. beyond just what we can see and touch and mm -hmm. taste and buy. And so I, I push gently all of our people to consider how materialistic we're being every day, mm -hmm. how much our lives reflect a materialistic worldview mm -hmm. and to challenge ourselves to reach beyond that. Cause that's uncomfortable. Do you, do you ever get pushed back? I mean, do you get, I mean, you must, you know, just, 
because of your sheer numbers, but I mean, from the other church or other churches or from, because your message is just so different. I mean, it's um, very controversial many times. <laughs> I mean, is, just yeah. to put it out there. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, and you don't shy away from difficult topics. And so do you feel like sometimes, oh, I might've pushed it a little too far or <laughs> oh, yeah. get a lot of complaints <laughs> or, I mean, how do you deal with that? How yeah. do you, you know? Every Sunday afternoon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that exactly what you're saying, but I do think we're, we're trying to be, um, gentle. Yeah. I think we're trying to be wise. Yeah. And we're trying to be even handed in how we talk about truth. Mm -hmm. Because truth isn't, it, you know, the, the Republicans, Democrats, you know, individuals, we don't have the corner of, on truth, right? We, we've, uh, we've maybe got a shred of it, mm -hmm. but there's something greater. There's something more mm -hmm. that's true, objectively, ultimately mm -hmm. true. And so we're in search of that. So yeah. when we tackle tough subjects, like in the last month, we talked about abortion and we talked about immigration. Well, mm -hmm. what I had to say made certain people really upset mm -hmm. uh, about abortion. And what I had to say about immigration made the other section of people really upset. So would you change the message if you could go back no. or just stay to the no, course? No, you know, it's very, we, we think through it as a team, mm -hmm. especially those difficult topics. Like we have a team of people that come together and go, what do we believe? What does the Bible say? What do we think is true? That's interesting because you always hear of religions being so kind of the divine right of kings, like coming from the top and filtering down, but you're more democratic about it, you're saying. It's a run lot of the time. more yes. like a company. It, that's right. No, it stews around a table. Obviously it starts with my wife and I and, and God and prayer, but but we are a team here, our mm -hmm. staff especially, and, and some uh, lay leadership as well. And we have these conversations before, during, and after these, these tough subjects are, are broached mm -hmm. to make sure we're being careful because the last thing we wanna do is say something that we just feel like saying instead mm -hmm. of saying something that is the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather say nothing at all. Yeah, now I get that. So this is your congregation. This is where people meet. This is it. For worship. And your this Sunday was your first Sunday back. Is that right? right? Yeah. And first how Sunday. did it go? I mean, what was it like? It was beautiful and strange. <laughs> you know, just to see people and not just a camera lens yeah. for the first time in 210 days. Yeah, this room is so empty. Oh, man. You know, it was it's... just uh, more than half a year. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and it was su such a long journey with yeah. so much stress. Um, as mm -hmm. you can see, this room is not much. It's just cement floors, unvarnished uh, walls, and just plain everything. Mm -hmm. But it's the people that make the church. True. And so we were in this building recording worship every Sunday, mm -hmm. but that wasn't church. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really church until the people came back. Yeah. And so even though we were socially distanced and masked, and I couldn't tell if people were laughing yeah. at my jokes or scowling, <laughs> uh, it was still people, and it was our community back yeah. together, and there's nothing like that. That's true. But one could say that you, in a weird way, benefited from not having them live because they were still there. They were just following you, you know, in a different way, yeah. which has now become your third and potentially strongest campus, <laughs> which is the online follower uh, viewership. Right. And your podcast, which now is in over 40 countries. Is that right? That's and, right. And, you know, was like the number one spirituality podcast voted by Apple last year. So, you, you know... In a way, it's like the thing has a life of its own. And, this, right. and this experience is just pushing that That's right. forward. So God taught us to, over the last seven months that the church is indeed not a building. Mm -hmm. It is not the walls. It is not the, the space. It is the people. Mm -hmm. And in terms of people, the church grew. Mm -hmm. We had people who have joined the story without ever meeting anyone here in person, without ever stepping foot in the building. They just wanted to be a part of this community yeah. because of what they experienced online. And not just with worship, but like you said, with the Maybe God podcast, that is, I mean, the reach of Maybe God has blown up. As, yeah. as in Maybe God, for like an hour long episode, we tackle some subject or we tell some story that really matters. Yeah. And there's something about inviting someone who's not a churchy person mm -hmm. to listen to a podcast rather than to come with, with you to church on Sunday morning. That. I've listened to a few of them. Oh, great. Thank I, you. I think um, I think you're onto something. Oh, wow. I, I really think this is interesting. And, and it's, you know, in a certain way, it's very, it'll be interesting to watch your growth and see where it leads you. Because, yeah. I mean, how do you feel when people, how do you feel about the word evangelist? Oh, I, li <laughs> I, I like the word. I, I'm scared of, um, of all of it going to my head. Luckily, I've got my wife who keeps me grounded, <laughs> well grounded, and I've got a team of people who, who know me yeah. to my core. They're not gonna let 
this growth or anything go to my head. And we're all in this together, like yeah. with Maybe God, the production team of Maybe God, yeah. an incredible team and working so hard to get this message out because to us, nothing matters more than the truth of God's love for all humanity. Well, I, that is true. And no matter if you're religious or not, if you if one, you listen to you speak once and and you could agree, anyone could agree that you are the perfect person to convey that message. Wow. Because your message is very powerful. You are an incredible speaker. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for having me here today. And I'm so excited to see the, you know, all of your future Mm, uh, plans you. unveil themselves and um, we'll just wait and watch and see what happens. Thank you, Francine. Best it's an honor that. to be a part of this.